What's apparently shockingly well hung? My young male lead from the movie Spy Kids, but now now he's in his like 30s, so it's fine. He's a father. Is that a good oh intro, God. Sophie? Is that a good intro? Yeah, I was, You spent I, I 10 was... minutes before the episode talking to me about the fact that the Spy Kids kid grew up to marry Megan Trainer and have a huge wang. Well, and now was, everybody's got to know about it. I was it. discussing how, for some reason, and Ian, who is also here, hi, Ian Johnson, that we what get up? on Twitter, we get this like at pop crave yeah, account yeah. that neither of us follow. I, and everything I know about uh, K pop comes from Twitter, it, believing that I am incredibly K-pop. interested in K pop. Well, no, you I'm just should saying. Be incredibly interested Twitter, in K pop. Twitter picks things for you to be interested in. Yeah, That's just okay, the way well, it works. Well, can I, can I, can I just. I, I feel like I owe it to the listeners to to read to read this update. to talk about to yeah, talk about this I mean, former child Sophie former child so first off problematic okay so spy kid <laughs> okay so 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 I'm not even okay Megan Trainer causes chatter online after discussing her painful sex with big boy husband Daryl okay, I don't care okay. he's the spy kid okay. I was joking about it being she can't walk after I'm gonna read the whole fucking thing thank you very much good, good that she Lord. can't walk after sex it's to the point where I'm like is it all in and he's like just the tip and I'm like I can't do anymore and I don't know how to fix that why they think that's what you want to see, Sophie. That's what I mean, Elon thinks. That's you want what to Elon see. thinks of me because honestly, I feel bullied. <laughs> like this, this is, is this is this is the first time that I have not been cripplingly depressed in weeks. So oh, you're thank welcome. you. You're yeah, welcome. no, this this really I was right on the edge there, Sophie. I was right on the edge. Well, but uh I'm, I'm glad, learning I'm glad about your back. Learning about this this former this child's daddy. massive, yeah. massive meat wagon uh has really has pulled me through. Um it's my uh, it's my Prozac. Well, I just about felt like these the people I was formerly unaware of and their sex. That's debates. fair. They're they're also the couple that has two toilets in their bathroom so they can shit next to each other, mm-hmm. uh, which you know all of this is fine. Well, no, it's not. But all of this is fine. But like, why do I have to know about it? Why does Ian have to know about it? And why do all of our listeners have to know about it? And I'll tell you all why. of our listeners have to know about it because you would not stop well, telling t- me about well, it. I'll tell you why. I thought they deserved a little bit of a ha 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 before we got into this episode. What are we talking about, Robert Evans? Well, you know, earlier this year, uh, right at the start of this year, uh, we did a four parter on Mr. Andrew Tate because I thought people needed to know more about him. There wasn't at that point really any kind of comprehensive profile on him. List look at his life, you know, kind of covering the whole sweep of, of everything he'd done and how he got to be so influential. Um, you know, and at the I, I decided that enough has happened in the months since then that it was time for an Andrew Uptate. Wow, mm, Chris! Mm, please, please, mm, please insert mm, some some uh, snaps for snaps Robert. snaps for Robert. Mm. Please insert some snapping noise and some like little yeah. li- like a little applause, but not too yeah. loud of applause. Just like a little applause. No, no. Find me like a standing ovation clip from the VMAs or something. That's Throw that fair. in there. Like three solid minutes. You know what? Let's um, bring it back. Find applause for Megan Trainer performing. There at you the go. VMAs. There you go. Money. Make it all connect. So at the time we covered Monsignor Tate, uh, he was still locked up in a Romanian jail. Um, There was not a whole lot of good info about his early life and rise to prominence. So I had to do a lot of digging to fill in holes since there just wasn't as much out there as there is now. And what there was out there was not conveniently located in articles. It was scattered throughout literally hundreds of different video clips Mm -hmm. on multiple different websites. Now, in the months since, Andrew has, number one, been released to house arrest. Uh, He's gone through, obviously, during the time he was in jail. He had a bit of a jailhouse odyssey of his own, which we'll talk about. Um, And he's also attracted a huge amount of reporting resources from outlets like Rolling Stone and the recently deceased BuzzFeed News. This has provided us with a lot more context about his early life, about kind of his rise to prominence, um, about, you know, a couple of small mysteries that we had during the initial episodes we did. Uh, In addition to that, some of our own fans, or at least one of our own fans, has done some digging on the subreddit, and they found some clips uh, from some of Tate's videos that provided some additional context on his backstory. So today I'm going to give you guys an update on what's gone down since we last talked, uh, as well as an expansion of the stuff we covered last time based on some new information. Most of the new info we've received focuses on his father, Emery Tate, uh, and what happened between him and his family 
family during the part of Andrew's childhood that was previously a little bit of a black box. Uh, oh, yeah. By the way, uh, Ian and Sophie are the guests for this episode. Hello, Ian and Sophie. We did. I realized I hadn't introduced you. But OK, you we did? did. But yeah. No. Wow. Happy wow. to be back. I think brave, brave of me to introduce you twice. <laughs> that shows how much gratitude I have. You were just so uh, enamored by that by that uh, big dick story that you couldn't you couldn't remember uh-huh. what had happened. You were dickmatized. Oh yes, yeah. his eyes got glossy and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, a lot of what I have learned here comes courtesy of a user on our subreddit, uh, Chicken Stuff eighteen, who combed through a bunch of again. Andrew's backstory is kind of scattered throughout hundreds of videos, many of which are lies. Um, so some of the information in the videos this guy uh, came up with was uh, I found really compelling because we had kind of I talked a lot about Emery Tate, his father, the chess legend. Um, we mentioned kind of one unsettling story Andrew told about him, like being shoved by him, uh, a weird story about kind of him pulling his son out of a tournament for crying. Um, but we didn't know a whole lot about the guy. Um, in some of these videos that were brought to my attention, uh, Tate admits that his father was a diagnosed narcissist, um, which makes a ton of sense. Uh, R.E. Andrew's behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So that tracks. It, yeah. And he he ties Andrew in it while he never like like stops idolizing his father. He ties his father's likely narcissism to his eventual separation from the military and the fact that the family was destitute when Andrew was a kid. Um, in Andrew's recollection of events, um, which probably doesn't entirely correspond with reality, um, but probably does correspond with what he was told as a kid by his dad, Emery, you know, because Emery is working for uh, the Air Force, um, and he has an argument with a superior officer over how to, like, translate some sort of document that they've, they've taken in, um, and Emery is unable to, like either admit that he's wrong or like give up the argument, right? You know, that kind of way that that narcissists do where, you know, a thing that a normal person, even if the normal person is like, well, you know, I don't agree with this. At a certain point, you just kind of like let it go. Usually Emery, Emery keeps on this to the point that it makes it impossible for anyone to work with him. Um, He is initially, um, like uh, forced off of his actual duties and like made as, to like work as a janitor. They're basically like you, you because of how you can't let this go. You are no longer capable of doing your regular job. So like sweep the fucking floor. Um, but he continues to be such a problem that the Air Force offers him a separation from the military. Now, he has been doing this long enough that he qualifies for a pension And his superiors are like, look, this is a messy situation. We will basically put you on disability and thus allow you to, like, get a pension. Um, But you have to admit to the diagnosis that our internal doctors have given you of narcissistic personality disorder. Um, The phrase that Andrew uses for this uh, that his dad presumably told him was that the Air Force was asking Emery to put a price tag on his sanity. Uh, And he refused to do that and thus did not get a pension. Um, And that's why the entire family wound up destitute. Um, And, you know, there's some evidence uh, that this is more or less what happened. Rolling Stone looked into the story. They confirmed that Emery was discharged from the Air Force in 92. And his biographer wrote, quote, superiors believed Tate embellished intelligence uh, and cited a personality disorder. Now, that's a little bit different from what Andrew's claiming, you know, which was that he had an argument with a superior about how to translate a document. Um, uh, The way that the uh, his biographer describes it, it sounds more like Andrew was like exaggerating things, maybe for personal benefit. Um, In any case, uh, said biographer also notes that Emery became an alcoholic after leaving the Air Force, which which interrupted his chess career and got him kicked out of at least one tournament. Um, Despite all of this, Andrew continues to idolize his father, portraying his refusal to acknowledge his diagnosis or accept this pension as an act of courage. And I want to play you a clip of him talking about this from an interview he did with a guy named Patrick Bet David, who... I don't really totally know how to describe Patrick. He's like kind of in the uh, the weirdo right wing grind city Which communities. Which guy is he in this video? He's the dude in the back. He's the dude um, in the back in the blue jacket. Yeah, and he's mm-hmm. he's Who's interesting because he's. I I uh, I I don't know. Um, I assume one of his cronies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pa- yeah, Patrick. But he, Patrick did famously an interview with Alex Jones. Um, kind of early in Alex's legal troubles. That's actually not bad. It's one of like the better early 
like ad, ad, kind of adversarial interviews with with Alex. Um, but anyway, here's Andrew talking about his father to Patrick Pat David. But anyway, when they discharged him, they said he had narcissistic personality disorder. And the reason they said he had that is because he refused to listen to one of his commanders. I don't know the exact story, so I don't want to say it on tape, but he refused to listen to one of his commanders about a recording on a tape. And my father was arguing with him about the translation of an, a certain word. My father believed it was slang for something else. Superior believed it was something else. They got into a personal beef. It developed over months and months and months of arguments about translations. And eventually, he ended, my dad ended up t- being told to sweep outside for eight hours a day. And I got to the point where my father got discharged. So when they discharged him, they diagnosed him with narcissistic personality disorder because he said he wouldn't listen. And they offered him this military pension and he refused it. He said, my sanity is not for sale. Huh. And I know that line because my mother used to scream all the time when we were broke in the house. You could have had money, Emery. My sanity is not for sale. Because we, we went yeah. broke. Because <laughs> now we went broke. Now we went broke, right? So I remember them arguing, Emery, we could have had money. Now we're broke. So, because he became a professional chess player, he couldn't pay the bills, and we were living in Indiana and South South Chicago. We were in the ghetto with no money. So I remember him saying that all the time. So um, eventually, my mother was it was English. We decided to move back to England because England has social housing. You get a free house and you can get benefits and that kind of thing. We moved back, and and my father stayed there. So I didn't see my father very much from the time I moved. But my mother was always in charge of keeping me alive, and he was just in charge of like giving me the lessons and stuff. So yeah, it was an interesting life. But he was he was a super principled man. Like he turned down money. What was actually interesting towards the end of his life, about three or four years before he died. Um, no, no, it must have been way before that because I didn't have money yet. Maybe 10 years before he died, he called me and said, you know, I've been principled for so long and, and the way the world's turning and what American government's doing. And maybe I should have just signed. Or do you think I should have just signed? He didn't say maybe. He said, do you think I should have just signed? I said, no, dad, no, you, you get to live with a pure heart. You shouldn't have just sign it. Because your mother's saying that I should just sign it now and because I get back. Sign what exactly? Sign yeah. that the narcissistic personality disorder, oh. sell his sanity and get back pay. Why is the, time, the audio like, quality terrible? Oh, like, and and just, by the way, just so you know, a lot of people sign it. A lot, a lot yeah. of military. I mean, you know, so, people so, who get that's that's um that's all really interesting to me. I think parts of this are true. Back pay with stuff like disability can work kind of similarly to how uh, Andrew describes it. I've known people who were in the military and on disability and like were later found to be at a higher level of disability and like got 10 years of back pay or something. So it's not impossible that it might have worked some way similar to this. Um, that said, there's definitely a lots of lies in here, too, or at least things that Andrew's not willing to believe about his background. Um, I think it's more on the side of lies because he talks different ways about why they moved to England at different points in time. Um, in other clips, he acknowledges that they didn't move because England had social housing and, you know, they were just so poor. They moved because his dad cheated on his mother and that made her leave the United States and want to return to the United Kingdom. Although the fact that his narcissism was stopping them from being able to support themselves probably played a role in why she was willing to do that. We've got another clip here. You know, it's actually funny. I'll tell you a quick story about him. When when my mom and dad split up, we moved to England and my sister stopped talking to my dad because... My, obviously, my mom was upset because they split up, and my dad cheated, and my sister stopped talking to that. When, when my sister stopped talking to my dad, me and my brother obviously still spoke to him, and he said, boys, when you're older, you'll, you'll understand. Mm-hmm. I'm, now I'm older, I understand. Yeah, yeah. he fucked a girl, so. Yeah. So, yeah. and this is what I mean by cheated. This whole idea of cheated to me is, it's, it's, it's propagated by, obviously, Western society. It's propagated by the, the powerful females, this idea that no man should ever dare fuck anyone but them. And to me, it's asinine. You're asinine, you dumb motherfucker. <laughs> it's just like, so stupid. It, it was just like, yeah, man, like it, if it's not uncommon for people to like bounce when they find out their partner's fucking around on them. Like that's Jeez, not a that's not moron. weird. That's not like uh, feminism, especially since it'd be one thing. Again, uh, it's not just that your dad was fucking around on your mom. It's that your dad led the family into gut wrenching poverty uh, and then slept around on your mom um, and was gone all the time. And as we're going to cover, was definitely abusive, at least mentally abusive. And obviously we talked about him shoving young Andrew around, probably physically abusive too. Um, here's a clip where Andrew talks about some of the pretty profound mental abuse that Emery subjected his children to. I remember going home to my dad and saying, hey dad, can I have a nightlight? He's like, no. It's like, but I'm scared of the dark. 
And I remember he was playing chess. He took to see, when I said I was scared of the dark, he looked at me. It was nighttime. He took my ass up to my bedroom, locked me in the bedroom in the dark, said, there's monsters in there, son. Good luck. See you tomorrow. I screamed and cried all night. I must have screamed and cried for an hour, hour and a half before I eventually fell asleep. Guess what? I never asked for a nightlight again. I never complained again. And guess what? I stopped being scared of the dark. Oh, my God. Brave. <laughs> wow. God. Yeah. Uh, so brave. Fuck. <laughs> the stories oh, he uses are like so they're, they're just supposed to be universal, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, a lot of kids are afraid of the dark. A lot yeah. of kids get over that fear. But uh, he got over it so quickly. The yeah, most quick. The most quick of yeah, anyone. The fastest anyone has ever gotten over being afraid of the dark. Oh. By himself. In, yeah. in an hour, and then he's just fine. And now he's Andrew Tate. And now he's Andrew fucking Tate. It is... So funny. Um, it's it's not funny that like his dad locked him no. in a closet. No, no, no. It's 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 it's. But he it just is didn't funny. Give him a nightlight and told him to go to bed and shut. <laughs> it is funny it, that it, he talked about it. That's what's it's funny. Fu- it's funny that he talked about it as like, isn't this awesome? This is yes. like my fucking uh, badass martial arts origin story. Like my dad <laughs> locking me in a closet. Probably given what else we know about Emery, he was drunk and didn't want to deal with his son. Yeah. Um, it's just it's like it's both fucked up what's funny is like the degree to which andrew like takes pride in it as like this is what made me the the tough competent man i am today is being locked in a closet at night when i got scared um so all of this along with rolling stones reporting paints a picture of andrew as a kid who showed i think always potential signs of becoming this kind of man um, although he might not have been sort of destined to go down, I don't think he was destined to go down the path that he did. Um, some of the conversations that Rolling Stone had with people who knew the Tates as kids when they were in the U.S. describe very young Andrew as a thoughtful and pretty well-behaved kid. One of the anecdotes I heard about him that stuck out is that during family dinners, he had a lot of like younger relatives, cousins and stuff, and he was always really careful to set up the table for them to make sure that they had all of the plates and utensils that they need. This was just like a thing. Thing he did without being asked is make sure that his his younger relatives were like taken care of at these family gatherings and stuff. Um, that said, there was always, you know, again, he's he's Emory Tate's kid. There was always sort of signs of the kind of man that he did eventually become uh, from Rolling Stone. Quote, those who knew Tate as a young man say they saw glimpses of misogynistic braggadocio and a need for attention, though they never imagined it would reach this point. If this Tate is a caricature, then it's one rooted in truth and morphed out of control. The character he's created is based on what he thinks masculinity should be, a source who knew Tate as a young man says. And this is the sad thing about it. He has been playing this character for so long that he has actually become worse than the character he portrays. Um, and I think kind of the basis of his character is the way his dad portrayed himself. Um, that's that's the impression that I get to to quote from a a, a, a great band. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like that's uh that's that's all kind of interesting to me. Um, I would say so. I I think like one of the things that you have to get here is there at kind of the core of Andrew is both that his dad, who is this alcoholic narcissist who cannot admit his own failures and also cannot take care of his family. Andrew's never able to put down the lies that his dad kind of tells to, to justify this. Um, And at the same time, when his mom leaves, he's never really able to honestly process that. Um, And I think this sort of mythic image of his dad just becomes his kind of attitude towards what masculinity should be forevermore. Um, this uh, affects Tristan as well. His younger brother grows up. Oh, as, I always and, forgot about. I almost forgot. Every about everyone Tristan. does because <laughs> he's he's not interesting on his own. And other people who knew the Tates as like boys in the UK will claim that Tristan was kind of Andrew's lapdog his entire life. Like even as a little kid, um, that's certainly the way their relationship looks just from the video evidence we have today. Uh, a source described them as codependent, which uh, I, I don't doubt. Um, and said, it's like Tristan is held captive by Andrew and believes or follows everything Andrew says or does. Quote, another referred to Andrew as a father figure of sorts, saying that Tristan had modeled himself in Andrew's image due to their real father, Emery, being largely absent from their lives. And that's interesting to me. You've got sort of like Andrew, who's being this carbon copy of what how his dad presented himself to children, and then Tristan being a carbon copy of that. <laughs> um. It's a it's it's depressing. Like this is not the way human beings 
ought to live. But you know how human beings ought to live? How, Robert? Off of the products and services that support the show? That's right. And only this. Look, if there's not ads for food on for a couple of weeks, then you die. That's just the way yeah. it has to be we if you're living We unfortunately don't properly. make the rules here and have mm-hmm. little to no control over anything when it comes to ads. So uh, you get what you get, motherfuckers. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and stop yelling at us about it. Like, we can do anything about it. Just the ads we are simply, the ads. We simply cannot. Yeah. yeah. Ah, we are all B-A-Q. So additional reporting has also given us new details about uh, the Tate's life in the UK, uh, the Tate's lives in the UK's. Um, Tate has claimed you, numerous what you, times. What are, what are you doing? What, 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 what? Grammar, Sophie. I'm doing a grammar. <laughs> You're doing a grammar? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I love this show. Yeah. I'm doing a grammar. I'm doing a grammar. All right. Sophie. Well, I, I'm doing a that's not grammar, grammatically correct. Well, then you can take that up on the grammar pod launching next month, uh, where I mainly inform people about how they can attorneys general other job titles. So uh, let's talk about the Tates in the UK. Andrew has claimed numerous times that he was bullied for being an American and mixed race. Uh, Some sources agreed that he seemed not to fit in and that this may have contributed to him feeling the need to prove himself. That that does seem extremely likely. Oh, yeah. I mean, just simply, simply experiencing racism as a not white kid in the UK. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, I have no I have no doubt yeah. um, that that was yeah, a part no, of his childhood. No arguments here about that. Yeah. Um, Andrew also, though, seems to have exaggerated the degree to which he and his brother kind of financially struggled in their early days. Uh, we reported in our early episodes on claims that Andrew made at the start of his kickboxing career that he and Aunt, uh, Tristan had to live on, like, dirt cheap, horrible, unappealing food, this, like, bland concoction they called flavor as a joke. In other videos, Tate has claimed that they had to steal uneaten KFC leftovers from buckets on tables because they couldn't get enough protein otherwise. One person who knew him early in his career said that this was bullshit. He never came from poverty. If he's saying he's gone around to nicking KFC chicken, that's a complete lie. He had a portion of Ferrari. And there are photos of the time when Andrew claimed to be living off a pilfered chicken that confirms he did have a Porsche. I actually don't think Andrew is necessarily lying here. So let me let me explain this. Um, Andrew has always placed huge value on visible shows of wealth, and nothing seems to do more to for his ego there than displaying expensive vehicles that he owns. I can imagine him early in his sports career getting a big prize after winning, a, you know, a competition. Some of them were like a hundred thousand um, dollars, and that's a lot of money. But given the nature of his business, it's also the kind of thing you maybe get one of those every year, or even every like two years. So, right. you know, most people would like you. You have to be kind of careful with that. I don't have trouble seeing him blowing most of a year's living cash on a car that he can show off with, and then scrounging for the basics of survival everywhere else. Right? Right. Like that. Sure. that or like actually, renting a car to like take some photos or yeah, something yeah, 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 yeah. and then t- taking it back or something like that. Yeah. It's yeah. all about appearances like that. That's yeah. that's not too far fetched. Yeah. I, 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 th- I think that what he might not be in lying about that. One of the most compelling details from that Rolling Stone article to me is that they bring up an early reality TV appearance by Andrew that I had not been aware of. In 2009, we talked about his uh, his appearance on that like fucking weird dating show thing. Yeah. Uh, but in 2009, he was on another show called Ultimate Traveler, which is a British competition where young people in Indonesia like backpacked on camera and they had like different sort of challenges where who can get to this place fastest you know on foot or using public transit or whatever uh oh, and then like it, amazing race type vibes yeah it seems like it was a kind of a discount amazing race the prize okay. was like 10 grand um and it, it seems to have basically been like backpack very simple backpacking challenges Got um it. and they they kind of voted you had like the prize went to whoever like the other contestants voted had done best um anyway uh-huh. here's andrew's first introduction there my plan is to lie and cheat my way through this competition. Once in a lifetime opportunity. 
Yeah, so that's that's Andrew. You can you can see at that early stage, he's already kind of settled on a vision for the character of himself. He's the bad guy who gets results. He's not constrained by the ethics of lesser men. He'll lie and he'll cheat. Um, but there's also this kind of like necessary humility he has to show because he try he's trying to break into TV. This is a show where like everyone on it is like an inexperienced traveler, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little more a little more vulnerability than he would admit to kind of in the present day. Um, here's here's a clip of him from that show that's a bit longer. 21 year old Anglo American Andrew Tate is a straight talking entrepreneur with his own advertising company in Luton. I'm very mentally strong. If I want to achieve something, I will achieve it because I've never been in a situation in my life so far in my 21 years where I really wanted something and didn't get it. I'm not sure what my fellow travelers would be like. Um, the worst kind of people would either be two-faced people, which is undoubtedly going to happen at some point during this trip. Um, people who seek attention and anyone who thinks they're exceptionally smart or exceptionally physically capable and they have nothing to back it up. It's going to quickly get my nerves. He just described himself. Yeah, it is. It is funny that he just described himself. <laughs> oh my god uh yeah that's i don't really want to like comment on his appearance or anything but he does look like a he in, he looks like a slim jim he does look like a slim jim sophie <laughs> yes, he because he, he looks he like you would snap into him right yeah yes. um yes and i do mean that in a sexual way uh, um I, I, oh never I, mind I was like, i was like i did not but okay yeah, Good yeah. You know. he, I, I'm just saying he had more he had more twink energy in this era than he does today. It looks like a slim Jim. Yeah, yeah, like a slim Jim. Um, so one person Rolling Stone interviewed described his overall attitude on the show as desperate, um, specifically desperate to be seen as the baddie. He's not as good at portraying himself that way as he will eventually become. Quote. This was not the impression that several people who worked in the show had of Tate. One source close to the production described him as hypersensitive, recalling an incident where he, during a bandana making challenge, blew up at another contestant who gently mocked him for getting paint everywhere. He seemed a little bit insecure, to be honest with you, they say. He just wanted to fit in. Contrary to his extremely libidinous, womanizing persona, Tate did not seem like a ladies' man and was rarely seen in the company of women, another source close to his reality TV career says. I don't think he's a guy who likes being around women, if that makes sense, they say. Mm -hmm. um, it sure does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's it's because, like, again, Andrew likes to be seen around women, but Andrew also does not have like the kind of self-confidence or ability to uh uh the or ability to like interact with people on anything that like could be approaching a level of equals like he cannot be around women who are not there because they need something from him right well, because they're vulnerable to him well robert he was the first kid to be the quickest to be no longer afraid of the dark so that's true get that's on true. his level ladies yeah, ladies, this guy, not afraid of the dark. Yeah. No, yeah, he just, like, seems like the kind of guy who, like, wants to be seen with women all the time, but he hates women, so, of course, he, like, can't, like, have a meaningful conversation with anyone or w actually have to yeah. interact with them. He just wants to be seen with beautiful women, but he hates women. Like. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, uh, he, def he, he definitely, like, uh, he's also afraid of them, though, right? We're, we'll talk about this a little bit later. It's not just that he, like, hates women. It's that he's scared to be around them if he's not in total control right. of them. Because w women have the ability to embarrass you. It's this yeah. kind of thing. It's also the the ability, you know, I, I don't think he's ever gotten over the fact that his mom left his mm -hmm. dad. Because it, it kind of, if he processes that, it kind of completely shatters this image of his father. Because his mom left not just because his dad cheated, but because his dad couldn't do the things that you're supposed to he do provide, as the yeah. quote unquote head of the family. Right. He's not taking care of shit. Um, and so uh, like that, that like it's the same. We're seeing Steven Crowder, who's a uh, uh, was is now much less of, <laughs> but was a very big right wing personality <laughs> has just, uh, b there's this ongoing blow up in the daily wire kind of far right sphere where all of his former friends are like rolling on him. But, one of the things that's come out is that he his wife is divorcing him and he went on a long rant about how this is only possible because the state of Texas allows uh, one party divorces. Right. Um, basically, if a woman doesn't want to be married, she can leave. And he hates a lot. A lot of men on the right hate this. Um, and Andrew hates this because, among other things, it means that, like, 
they have the freedom to embarrass you is the way he's seeing it. I'm not saying people should be embarrassed. Like, marriages don't work out. That's fine. I, you know, that's life. Um, but that's how he sees it, right? Um, <laughs> that's actually so funny. It's um, really fun. I mean, yeah, it is funny. It is funny because he's a piece of shit. It not, is funny because he's a piece of yeah. shit. Also, embarrassing men is a great hobby, and I encourage it it's, to many. It's 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 critical stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, um, it's kind of worth noting that, like, his initial life goal, right? He's martial arts. I, I do think he never really saw martial arts as much, but a stepping stone. Maybe there was a point at which he thought he could be like a big celebrity through it, but it became pretty clear early on. He does not have the kind of charisma that was going to make that possible. He's also not good enough at working with people. I think sure. like, you know, look at a guy, you know, uh, fucking Dave Batista, right. Who comes out of the MMA world and, uh, and became a great actor, famously good at working with people. I think that's generally the case with, with those folks. Andrew's just like, he's, he's an asshole. He's a giant asshole. And like, um, and like he wasn't good enough to be, you know, no, like he wasn't a Conor good McGregor enough either. Type yeah, villain exactly. Where, like that's just yeah. not happening. He yeah. You can get away with being the giant piece of shit. If, if you you're a fucking back goat, it up. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, but he, he just isn't, he's not like a Mike Tyson, right? Mike right. Tyson can get away, could get away with some shit because he was very good at punching people. Um, certainly Andrew Tate's just kind of mid at punching people. So before settling Burn. on social media and, you know, kind of being a weird online discord cult leader, his first clear goal was to become big on reality TV and then parlay that celebrity into a larger career. Um, he decided the best way to do this was being seen as aggressive and dangerous, which is also so funny because like i think about um two of the the uh, three of really the biggest kind of people to come out of combat sort of sport type dealies um and and go into uh uh acting in the recent past and like obviously two of them are you know pro wrestling which is very different from mm-hmm. mma but like you know, you look at Dave Batista, you look at The Rock, you look at um oh what's his name? The guy in Peacemaker. Oh, John Cena. Um, Cena, Cena. But, yeah, John yeah. Cena's like his uh, own uh, kind of thing, but yeah. It, it it is it is interesting to me. His attitude is like, well, if I want to break in as a big celebrity, people have to see me as the dangerous asshole. Well, like all of the big celebrities that came in through like fighting kind of media are like famous for being really pleasant yeah, like people. Universally like that's beloved. a huge part of their brand is them, is them yeah, being John nice. Cena's right? done like the most make a wishes <laughs> of all time. And like, is yeah. generally just like the like, chillest dude. Of course people love him. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a, and it's interesting, like how kind of out of the zeitgeist he is. There was a time, you know, look, you, you can look at like, um, uh, Steven Seagal, right, who also comes out of kind of fighting sports, right, and who's famously a giant asshole and a psychopath and a rapist, um, a lot like Andrew Tate. But that was a really different era, right? By the time Andrew was trying to break in to stardom, we in the West have decided that when we when we make a, a big fighting guy into a celebrity, we want him to be like a friendly giant as opposed to a crazy asshole. Um, yeah, that's just where we are now. You know, uh, you can you can take what you will from that. Um, anyway, I found a story about Andrew in one of these articles that I think says a lot, like kind of reinforces the point we were making about how he feel his awkwardness around women. Uh, there's a story in the Rolling Stone report about a woman who visits him, who visited him and Tristan in their home for a party uh, in like 2009 and described him very differently from how he's usually described. She said it was a really good time at first. Andrew is hanging out with her and her friends. He gives her like a boxing lesson. She's having a lot of fun with him. Um, but he's also kind of like a weird guy. Um, she noted that he was like, she, there wasn't like much interesting or creative about him. Like he knew how to fight, but he didn't really have much to talk about. Um, and he kept kind of like going over the same lines, talking about his Porsche, talking about his championship belts. And after a while, they decided to like, you know, this is the UK, take the piss out of him a little bit, right? So they, she and a friend do a photo shoot in front of his Porsche with like posing with his championship belts and dressed, they dressed his punching bag and girl's clothes, right? They were like fucking around with him a little bit, you know? Um, and they posted this shit on Facebook and he blows up like the, what sounds like a very scary, like, like like rage episode he's cursing at them calling them bitches you get the feeling he's kind of at least being physically threatening although they they certainly don't say that he like attacked them um but like so they leave and they never see him again um but it's one of those things where like he's kind of 
the instant he's laughed at, he he ex- like that that just absolutely destroys any kind of self control he has. the 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 mere fact of a woman laughing at him is the thing that like devastates this man. Um, I don't I, know. Says a lot. Well, so many women have laughed at him since. So yeah, sucks yeah, to yeah. Suck. Man, <laughs> and it's one of the again <laughs> like one of the one of the the best things you can. Uh, be as a guy uh if you if you are interested in like not being a creepy weirdo is not flip the fuck out when people laugh yeah. at you because it happens just in taking life. rejection yeah. well is a, a skill i think more people need yeah. to develop <laughs> yeah it uh it, it 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 really deeply unsettles people when like you do something silly and they laugh at you and then you act like a psychopath <laughs> like the, that makes people think that you might murder yeah, them <laughs> it's generally not fun to be around those kind of people <laughs> yeah it's uh you know we live in the society we live in uh you should you should put a lot of focus into being someone who doesn't uh doesn't give off i might murder you yeah. vibes it's important yeah. it's a good rule of thumb <laughs> Yeah, a good rule of thumb. Don't seem like you might murder people. They don't like that. <laughs> um, but Andrew, again, Andrew's whole ego is like wrapped up in seeming like a person who might murder you. Right. Um, bad way to make friends, uh, in my opinion, Andrew. So I think a thing I didn't get across well in my earlier episodes um, was this kind of added context, which I think it, it what it makes undeniable is this vast emptiness at the center of Andrew, right? Like that's what these two girls claim is that like, you know, they think it might be fun to hang out with him at first, but there's just nothing there. All he's got to talk about, all he's got within him is these kind of visual signifiers, these belts in this car of success, but there's like nothing. He's not about, there's no substance. Um, there's no substance. Um, now we get some different stories from girls who knew him when he was younger about like how he, he got rich. His, his, a earlier girlfriend, a woman named Svet, who a couple of news agencies have talked to, says that he got rich not from manipulating girls into camming, but via kickboxing and crypto. Um, that may have been a lie uh, that he told her to disguise that he had earned his money via camming. It's a little unclear to me, but I'm going to quote again here. With her, she says, he adopted the persona of a family man. He would just say he was looking for a sincere girl with a pure soul to start a family and have three to five children with, she says. Indeed, Svet says Andrew Andrew was particularly obsessed with getting her pregnant and insisted on having sex without protection. He talked many times about giving her pregnant and having her raise his children, she says. A spokesman for Tate uh, says Andrew vehemently denies any allegations that suggests he urged previous girlfriends to have unprotected sex. Um, So that's, uh, you know, I I, I feel like we have to put that in there for legal cases. But uh, it is like. Uh, interesting to me. All of this, all of this context, I think, fills him out and makes him a, a, a sadder example of a person. Yeah. Uh, it it seems like his decision to become an influencer and effectively create a cult around the image of himself as a business guru and philosopher came after he was kicked off of Big Brother as a result of the rape allegations against him. We can pretty definitely say that he exaggerated his claims of wealth at varying points in various videos. Tate claimed to be worth $700 million and sometimes to be the world's first trillionaire. Uh, Romanian police were able to confiscate about $4 million worth of assets. Now, I don't doubt that he had more than that, obviously. It's not hard to hide stuff, but I don't think it was anywhere close to 700 million, let alone a trillion dollars. Now, his former girlfriend also notes that he regularly claimed to be on a tight budget, perhaps due to all the money he had to spend on the fancy cars and the Rolexes and other signifiers of wealth. Whatever the truth, the source of most of his money grew to be subscriptions to his various online schools and the War Room, a series of private Discord rooms for people he described as his insiders, a.k.a. anyone with $5,000 they were willing to <laughs> give to Andrew Tate. In videos I watched, he tries to portray the War Room as like his the new Illuminati You know, these are the most influential men you've never heard of. They're going to get they could get me out of any bad situation I got into. If I get into a problem in any country, they can pull me out of it right away. You know, I have connections everywhere. They'll take vengeance on my enemies for me. Leaked chat logs from the war room reveal more pedestrian realities. There's a video of a guy who enrolled in the war room and presumably spent all that money and did a vlog review of his time there. Uh, And he describes what the organization teaches as uh, telling members how to become a, quote, pimping guy who looks down on women, uses them and abuses them and manipulates them to get what he wants. Uh, He provides a screen grab of a member of the war room telling other people how to coerce their partners on camera um, to like have sex on camera. Like it's, it's that sort of stuff. Like it's not, 
you know, these James Bond types all talking about how to manipulate the stock market. It's guys being it's like, here's weird mouth how to sexually assault a woman and profit yeah. from it, yeah. right? That's the, yeah. Here's how to be all, a predator and go. Yeah. Like, ew. Uh, also... Uh, also, guess who? Guess who was a member of the war? Room? I guess oh, still is a oh, member of the tell war. Tell us! Tell us! I'm so is excited! I'm so excited! Jacob Wool. No way! <laughs> oh, that's incredible! Oh god! Yeah, the internet's favorite idiot boy, whose oh. only backstory again. Andrew's talk like these. He talks about these people like they're fucking captains of industry and like former spies. Jacob Wool's entire career is repeatedly failing at obvious political scams and then oh. getting sued like nearly into destitution for mani- attempting and failing to manipulate an election with a series of robo yeah, calls yeah. like great great catch getting kid grifter like <laughs> yeah what? yeah G- getting the guy who in like five different videos posed with the same cigar people proved it was the same cigar by looking at markings <laughs> on the wrapping uh because he doesn't actually smoke them he just wanted to be seen holding it oh. like <laughs> and he didn't have the money to buy more than one <laughs> It's, it's all so about cute. appearances with these guys. <laughs> it's all about appearances. And it, that's the thing with all these fucking guys. C- for whatever reason, cigars are a big part of it. I'll say this for Andrew. Like, I am a guy who smokes cigars. Andrew actually does appear to smoke his cigars. Like, he does it enough. Like, he d- he he does it like a guy who, like, it, Steven Crowder does the same thing, and so does Ben Shapiro. And I think they both hate cigars. Like, they do not, they, they are, they are like, they're, they're doing it like it's miserable to them. Like, they're kissing a snake. Right. Um, I will say, I think Andrew actually does enjoy that. Um, so, I'll, I'll say that for him. But, you know, that's not praise or anything. It just means some other guys are even sadder. <laughs> um Another guiding ethos of the war room is achieving autonomy from the Matrix by obtaining multiple passports and citizenships. Screen grabs of 2019 war room chat logs obtained by Rolling Stone appear to show the war room instructing men how to do so. In one screen grab, a user identified as Tate outlines a project to help people obtain multiple passports. Pay a price. Send old ID. Passport in the mail. We'll let you guys know as soon as we're live. Um, so yeah, there's like uh, pictures, Tate has posted pictures of like his fake IDs or what appear to be his fake IDs. Uh, and he's bragged about collecting passports to, uh, flee from the law in different countries, uh, which is part of why after his arrest, his one month stay in jail was extended three times. If you brag repeatedly about your access to private jets and multiple passports, that yeah. provides the government with a really easy case right. to put, describe Self, you as a flight risk. Self-incriminating yeah. as well. I've seen a enough episodes of law and order to know you shouldn't flaunt that kind of stuff when you're going to go to jail (laughs) no again an actual a dude who is the real version of what andrew pretends to be and thus has a bunch of fake ids and shit because he's doing crimes never would talk about it you don't mention the go bag you don't mention the go bag word not a fucking word no like watch heat that's how you handle this sort of shit (laughs) you don't brag about it on fucking tiktok So, um, Andrew, you know, once he gets locked up, this is at the end of last year, uh, kind of goes very quickly from this sort of James Bond, man of the world, uh, international man of mystery type, uh, 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 branding to unhinged tweets that he's like sending out via an intermediary. Like he, he goes like immediately from like. Uh, I am the business, you know, guru, influencer, ladies, man to like, I am fighting ghosts in my jail cell. Uh, My favorite example is this from February 25th. I was awoken last night by an icy chill and identified a ghost in my prison cell. He was terrified and begged me not to annihilate him. I sent him back to hell with a message for the demons. I am always ready. (gasps) (laughs) <laughs> that's just like how broken his brain is like even in these like fake scenarios he just has to be like the ultimate like badass like unfazed yeah. like he's i i can beat up ghosts is basically what he's yeah saying. i can fight like, ghosts um, it is funny that he's gone right back to bragging about like no my dad locked me in the fucking gr- closet yeah. and i fought the ghosts off on my own <laughs> A- Andrew, okay, that, okay, buddy. That, that was actually okay. that was actually Tristan. Yeah. <laughs> it's just beating, beating up, up his, his brother, brother in, in jail, <laughs> wailing on him. Oh, oh I love it. You know who would beat up their brother in the dark? Hmm. Every sponsor we have for this podcast. Okay, I'll take it. Yep. Oh, 
Ah, we're back. And uh, we're talking about Andrew Tate in jail. There were a lot of funny moments from his uh, his jail, his 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 letter from a from a Romanian jail. Uh, at one point, his representative claimed that he had been diagnosed with cancer and he needed to go to Dubai for surgery. Um, this was like publicly. They were saying this to all of their fans to right. try to generate this outrage. Was, this like, was very viral. He's going to die in yeah. jail. They're killing him. This is a murder attempt. Um, now, the Romanian government, he's in jail. They're not even. It's, I I say I wrote tapped his phone calls. He's in jail. They know what he's saying on yeah. the phone, right? Just the way that any jail system does, right? Like if you're talking, like to that's the way it goes. Yeah. Uh, so they and anyway, the calls that they listen to uh, in them, he is discussing like Dubai as a potential route for him to escape from. This is like claims made by people in the Romanian law enforcement. Uh, and since the UAE doesn't like ex- extradite to Romania, this makes sense, but also kind of backs up the government's claim that he can't be released. Uh, Once this stuff leaks, Tate, like that, once the like claims come out that like he's, he might be sick, there's a shadow on his lung. Tate was unable to handle the idea of people thinking he was sick, even though this was an important part of his escape strategy, because again, sickness implies unacceptable vulnerability. So he posts that. You can't have that. Oh my God. (laughs) No, no. He posts this. I do not have cancer. My lungs contain precisely zero smoking damage. In fact, I have an eight liter lung capacity and the vital signs of an Olympic athlete. There is nothing but a scar on my lung from an old battle. True warriors are scarred both inside and out. Oh my God. He's it's so delusion. funny. It's so I funny. I actually have Olympic um, level lungs, by the way. Like, Yeah, I can't get cancer. It's scared of me. <laughs> So uh, oh, I, I'm gonna con- I'm gonna continue Please. what he what he puts in this thread as one of the most influential men on the planet. It is important for the good of humanity that I live as long as possible. At the my current strength levels, I estimate to survive for at least five thousand more years. With this in mind, I take my medical care extremely carefully. I had a regular checkup organized in Dubai pre detention. The doctors were extremely interested in the scar on my lung. They do not understand how I survive without treatment. They do not know the secrets of Wudan, but this battle has long passed. He attached this photo in the thread. Sophie? Oh, oh. <laughs> Yane, I'm so sorry that I have to show you this. Lay it on me. Oh. Oh, buddy. It's it's just him doing a high <laughs> kick and posing in front of a mirror in his gym in his underwear. Oh like, my it's... god. <laughs> He's gonna flex the cancer away. <laughs> and this guy is worried about women laughing at him. Stop yeah. being hysterical. He's gonna live to be five thousand, so Sophie. Much- yeah, He's going to be the emperor of mankind. That's so cool. Women 5,000 years from now will still, be, still laughing be laughing at his bitch ass. They'll still be laughing. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. They, 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 they will have evolved beyond gender, and they'll still be laughing at him. The like amount they, of they, overcompensating. They will be living as, like, mental energy yeah. flying through the ether and laughing at him. For someone with such a fragile ego and who's clearly, like, really obsessed with like looking powerful and strong it's just given us so much fodder to make fun of him with it's like, like it's so funny he's doing it to so himself funny <laughs> mhm it's true and that's what really hurts so reporting based on sources within the Romanian judicial system suggests that Andrew directed a support campaign and may have intimidated witnesses from inside jail from an article by BuzzFeed News RIP Romanian authorities also said that the Tates have encouraged their army of followers to message at least one alleged victim demanding she retract her accusations. These comments are of a nature to provoke in the victim a state of fear as a result of the threatening tone they have in addressing her, attempting to determine her to change her statements regarding the accused in the case. The judge noted in the February summary. On top of this, in December, a U.S. law firm representing the brothers sent a cease and desist to a woman in Florida. This is the woman who he had been holding against her will, uh, whose mother contacted the FBI, who contacted U.S. authorities to free her, which is what started this whole series of investigations uh, kind of mid last year against Andrew Tate that led to his arrest. Um, so he Romanian authorities are at least looking at this as intimidation. Um, Andrew's lawyer, Tina Glandian, uh, number one, has said that her firm had no part in sending this cease and desist. Um, but obviously, a lot of Andrew's a lot of the harassment being directed against people who have made accusations against Andrew um, has a 
occurred in a somewhat decentralized manner. Andrew is stoking it, and he's certainly talking. You know, the Romanian authorities say he is directing his representatives to kind of incite harassment campaigns by his fans. Um, but it's not as simple as just like, oh, yeah, somebody paid someone to go do this. You know, he has people who are willing, who once riled up will go and take action. There's evidence that at least one fan attempted to track this woman down in her home in Florida. Um, thankfully, he did not succeed. Uh, but there is ample evidence that other fans have executed far-reaching harassment campaigns on women who have spoken out against him. Uh, we talked about Daria Gusa on our last episodes, who's the, she was the young Romanian woman who, when she was a child, was contacted by Tate in an attempt at grooming her. Right. She says after talking to the BBC for the article we cited, she received numerous threats, including a guy who found her phone number, texted her, and said that he knew where she went to college and had her class schedule. Oh, um, Jesus Daria Christ. claims that because of this harassment, several of her friends who also had contact with Tate refused to talk about it. Quote, it's not just the people who work for him. It's that there are basically millions of men out there who really idolize these people and would do anything to protect them in their image. So I think it's completely justifiable that so many girls don't want to speak out. BuzzFeed's reporting also sheds more light on one of the women arrested with the Tates, a former Romanian cop named Radu, who is suspected of using her position to gain illegal access to a classified police database over most of 2022. A judge noted that, quote, it would be impossible for the accused to access the database without support from others, which might be seen to suggest that some Romanian authorities believe a broader conspiracy exists with, among members of their law enforcement agencies. That said, this all doesn't necessarily mean that there's some, like, hidden Tate cadre inside of Romanian policing. This could, and probably is, I'm going to say this is the most unlikely explanation. Radu is really devoted to this guy, partly maybe because she's in love, partly because there's financial benefit here, and she's bribing her colleagues for specific favors, right? This is a known problem that Romania has, bribery among public officials. There doesn't have to be, like, some secret, like, cadre of Tate supporters within Romanian policing for this to have happened. Radu just needs to have thrown some money around. Um, at any rate, BuzzFeed's reporting suggests that Radu may have helped quash earlier allegations in Romania against Andrew. In addition, prosecutors said they had obtained new information from the police unit local to the Tate compound, suggesting that women had filed multiple complaints of violence, coercion, and abuse against the brothers that predated the current case. These complaints have gone unresolved, giving rise to suspicion of undue influence from Radu. So basically, the thing, he only got in trouble this time. Like, this whole chain of events started because he was allegedly keeping that woman from Florida held against her will. And her family contacted U.S. authorities, and that got the ball rolling on all of this. But there were claims from women in Romania and attempts to report to the police earlier that this Romanian cop quashed because she's on Andrew Tate's team. She's profiting from this with him. Um, there are also allegations that prosecutors make that Tate ordered his team to reach out to two right-wing Romanian politicians. Both of these guys are like big gender politics culture war dudes and COVID deniers. One of them is on Ukraine's sanctions list for spreading Russian propaganda. And basically, I mean, here, here's the quote from Tate to uh, talking to his assistant to telling her what to say to the two politicians. If you take the side of the guys, when they get out of prison, they will make sure you are rewarded for telling the truth. Um, that's what he told his assistant to say to these uh, these politicians. Um, now, to be fair about that, like both of these right wing politicians seem to have seen where the wind was blowing because they didn't they did not agree to work with him. And in fact, when asked by local media if they were willing to defend Tate, they said no. So it kind of seems like this was a. Uh, Again, part of Tate had this kind of belief that, you know, between my money and my connections, I can make anything happen. Um, but mm -hmm. he he flew too close to the sun. Like there's this 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 whole thing blew up too big. So when he reaches out to these guys who normally would have loved to be associated with him, they're like, nah, bro, you fucked up. Like, number one, cops are listening to everything you say. Like, we don't want to we're not like, fucking let's with that. start there. Like, number two, you are in a lot of trouble and we don't want to be associated with you. That's not smart. Valid. Um, when you put all this stuff together, it might be seen as somewhat surprising that the brothers were finally released from jail and into house arrest. Reporting does suggest they're under heavy watch there, so they're unable to leave the country with ease. But still, why were they released from jail? 
In an official summary of a late February court review, the judge who had been on their case from the beginning claimed that there were new reasons to keep the brothers incarcerated based on the government's surveillance of their calls, and I found this in an article in The Guardian. The accused present a clear danger for public order. They made preparations to evade criminal investigation by leaving Romania and are trying to influence witnesses and are exerting pressure on the victims. But a month or so later, two different appeals court judges, both of whom were new to the case, approved the move to house arrest. There doesn't seem to be a good explanation as to why this happened. BuzzFeed's reporting claims that there's ang- a lot was a lot of anxiety at the move in official circles. Um, it's hard for me to say what's happening here, what is going to occur. Um, there are reports from like the judges who are still on the case that the information that's come out and that the attempts to influence witnesses by Tate have prejudiced judges against their case. Quote, one experienced Romanian justice system insider who requested anonymity told BuzzFeed News that Andrew's various missteps while in detention stemmed from the influencer's need for public attention and his compulsion to arouse controversy. I think Andrew Tate is not the most intelligent guy, the insider said, and but he probably can't help himself. And it's, again, kind of unclear to me. You know, I think a lot of people were like, this is a bad sign that they've released him into house arrest. It was kind of unprecedented for them to hold him before indicting him for three months. So it's it's not entirely weird that this has happened. He is still um, like basically waiting for the indictment, which is should come before June, kind of based on the letter of Romanian law. They have to make a move kind of before June. Um, so we're, we will see what happens with that. I do want to talk a bit about the person that Andrew has hired to run his legal case, who is an American lawyer named Tina Glandian. Tina has made a career of working for high profile. He hired a woman. Yeah. Surprising. Yeah. Uh, uh, she is a surprising, well, Uh, in part, in some ways, a surprising, surprising, but also not surprising in terms of like PR. Yeah. 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 Well, and she's also, she, she is the disgraced celebrity lawyer. Her past clients included. Oh my God. Her past clients included Jesse Smollett. So uh, okay. <laughs> that wasn't a win. She that lost. one was she not lost. a yeah, dumb. Yeah. Uh, she also, she was not the primary lawyer for, but her boss was, and she helped with Chris Brown. Uh, she was the, uh, like representing okay. them. I'm uh, sensing a pattern. And she also represented Kesha uh, in one of Kesha's lawsuits against her former producer, which went a lot better. So obviously this woman, you know, you win some, you lose some. Uh, I found a very Justice puffy PR for piece. Kesha, first of all. I mean, yeah, that case, she was in the right. Uh, I found a very puffy PR piece about her on a website called Dan's Papers that included this quote. Glandian's legal counsel has proven invaluable to countless celebrities, professional athletes, and entertainers. Her list reads like boldface names splattered on page six, representing A-listers such as Kesha, Mike Tyson, and Chris Brown. Glandian was also the lead attorney in the Michael Jackson v. ExtraJet case after Jackson's chartered jet was illegally wiretapped. I am inspired by a desire to help people, particularly the underdogs, Glandian says. The feeling that someone is relying on me to tell their story or to right a wrong is a great motivator. I strive to give my clients a voice and to be their most zealous advocate so you know she sounds nice (laughs) uh she also claims to be a dedicated woman's rights activist in times when Uh, glandine is not conducting business or trying cases she is an outspoken advocate and a champion for women's rights both nationally and internationally she's a un representative for the armenian international women's association and part of the commission on the status of women so that's because when I think her. women's rights activists, I think lawyer who helped Chris Brown. Yeah, look, you know, get, take that paycheck, right? Uh, you can represent or, women or later. Or like, girl, don't. <laughs> no, you got you got to get paid first, Sophie. Got to get paid first, <sighs> and then you can represent Kesha uh, briefly, uh, but successfully. So since being released from jail, Andrew has continued to post. The funniest post I found from him since his release, he's uh, uploaded a like a a picture to Twitter of a bunch of little electric scooters, like 10 of them in the Walden yard of his compound. Cause he's on house arrest with the text. They raided my house and took all my cars. So I bought 10 new Bugattis. Um, so that's (laughs) sad. Uh, he still maintains his absolute innocence, uh, and says there's a 0% chance of him being found guilty. One video showed him walking around a room in his house, smoking a cigar while he says, since last year, I've been in 24 hour lockdown, no yard time, pacing a three meter cell with zero electronics or outside contact, absolute clarity of mind, real thoughts, real plans, vivid pain, one hour home and I can't stand my phone. Some habits die hard. We must defeat Satan. 
Like, what is he even talking about? Some habits <laughs> die uh, hard. We must funny. defeat Satan. I mean, it sounds like a guy who's. Afraid I mean, he of says Shaitan because he's like doing a <laughs> doing a doing a, a Muslim thing, uh, which I still don't know how serious he is about this. But like, I am still kind of. I'll be honest with you. It is unclear to me if he's trying to play this. Right. Like if he's if this is like if he thinks that this is a smart play or if he's actually coming unglued. Um, and I guess we won't know that for a while. Um, I mean, I don't see this all seems weirder than some of it. He's always had bits of this. Yeah. this like martial arts mysticism has always been a piece of him um, and a piece of his like his like public profile. It's so much more now than it was before. I mean, I think I think there's only one logical conclusion here is that the ghost won. <laughs> the ghost won. That he's, he's a, being piloted by the ghost. It's driving his meat yeah, suit. He's been possessed this whole time, uh, of course. Yeah. I think that's the truth. That's the truth. Well, yep. keep us posted. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh that's the Andrew update. Um Thanks I hope you that. all have had a good time. It wasn't as um, bad as and, I thought uh, it was yeah. going to be, so there's that, I guess. No, no, it's mostly funny. We'll be back uh, Thursday because I found some books Andrew wrote. We'll be talking with Shireen Lani Yunus about those. Um, but until then, you can find us in various places on the internet. I have a book called After the Revolution. You can just type it into wherever you find books. Uh, Ian, you got anything to plug? Uh, no, I mean, you know, just Cool Zone Media. Keep keep it moving. Uh, I'm I'm on the Twitter and Instagram, Young Hershey, Y U N G. I don't really tweet or post that much anymore these days, but I'm thinking about trying to get back into it. Maybe the fans will give me some inspiration. So, oh yeah, posting is always a good yeah. idea. Follow Ian, you coward. Yeah, no. Yeah, maybe you guys will get me back like uh, terminally online. So let's do it. Oh, actually, don't yeah. follow Ian. <laughs> that sounds bad. That's that's the life we want for you. <laughs> I think I would get, I think Lee, you could sue me if I tried to urge you to become online again. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's like a hostile that's work about, environment. That doesn't sound safe. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's the episode. Go to hell. Bye. I love you. Bye. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com or Check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.